to put it in other words, uh, by saying that he observes her and she looks at him and she sees him. Uh, so there is a subjective shot, him looking at her, then her looking back from her position above the rock, then again the same. Yet she's the one on a pedestal of sorts, the native to be looked at in her shockingly white virgin dress. The camera choreographs to, in the end, uh, the position of Salvador. It leaves us on Salvador's place, looking at Marinusa, running up the alley, flying away as a ghost. This is going to be pretty short. In this clip, Madinusa has been chosen as the virgin for the year in preparation for the holy time. Standing next to her is her father, who has been waiting for the holy time precisely to have an incestuous relationship with her. Salvador has taken a picture of her, and presumably he has been looking at the ceremony all this time, a tourist, a foreigner observer. So in these two clips I have shown we see what he sees. In this early part of the movie, he's shown as an observer, a sort of intradiegetic representative of the spectator, us. As modern viewers, we even may repeat what he says at some point uh, to her, Marinusa shouldn't be your name, you should be Rosa or Maria. Even when he's not, sh he's not shown observing, the camera takes on his role. It examines the town's preparations for the festivity and looks at the procession from afar as if it were a, a postcard. The camera operates that way, but the plot, which is my, my point about the tension, the plot goes in a different direction. Because the film is not about Salvador in the way that Vargas Llosa's novel was about Lituma or about the town, this communal festivity, is the setting that enables the action and not, as in Jaguar Fiesta, the driving force behind the action. The protagonist is Madeinusa. She is the focal point of the narrative, and we learn about her motivations, her desires and fears, the traumatic absence of her mother, who has migrated to Lima, the envy of her sister, and the ominous presence of her father. I am suggesting with all of this that there is a tension between the gaze and the plot. Let's go now to a scene where this tension between plot and gaze explodes into a question mark. Disculpe, no quería. Por Diosito se lo juro. No sé quién me trajo acá. Pero ese que don Cayo, ¿no? ¿Qué es eso? ¿Tiene llave? Sí. 
Es una grabadora, me sirve para trabajar. Así me acuerdo todo lo que se me ocurre. Así me acuerdo todo lo que se me ocurre. ¿Cuántos años tienes? Madinusa, ¿no? ¿Eres de Lima? Sí, sí es. Me tengo que ir. Espera. Um, as in the early sequence we saw, here the camera is fascinated with Madre Inusa, since she walks out of her house until the close-up of her eyes looking in at the foreigner uh, who's been imprisoned by Madre Inusa's, father, Madre Inusa's uh, father, who's the mayor of the town. The camera patiently follows her every step. Then the question mark. The montage associates her eyes to those of a nearby cow. What to make of this? At this point of the film, the plot has told us enough about Madre Inusa to understand why she may want to see the foreigner in secret. As we saw in the previous scene, she saw him taking a picture of her and may want to get it. Or um, he may be for her a way out of an impossible situation with her father, or a way into modernity, or both, which will be the case. The question, posed by the montage and the close-ups is whether, as spectators, we can continue to operate as Salvador does, presupposing that Madinusa is naive, instinctive, and primitive. To Salvador, Madinusa is anonymous because her supposed primitivism seems too legible. By this I mean too legible as illegible, and mostly incapable of agency. But as we can see in the dialogue that follows, it is not that she doesn't answer his questions because she cannot or because she doesn't understand or think, but because she strategically chooses not to. He is the only one who gives answers. But um, we may wonder who of the two is obedient and simple-minded as a cow. And we may conclude that it is the person imprisoned in the barn. The potential for this kind of inversion is developed through the rest of the film. We can see it in the following clip where Marinusa is seducing Salvador by singing a, a Waino uh, type of song uh, to him. We are far from Vargas Llosa's inarticulate uh, native female, uh, but Salvador is in a way like Lituma <coughs> because he may not quite listen or understand a warning sign hidden in the song. Perdido en el horizonte, 
perdido con tu mirar. Dime ya pues por favor, por qué me miras así. Kaina tanu hata kis paiha, sun kui kita musuas kaiki. Kaina tanu hata kis paiha, sun kui kita mabagusa, sun kui kita musuas kaiki. The Waino can be heard superficially as a simple seductive song that can be attributed even to an old local tradition, but it can also be listened to. It is a song that invites a reflection on the gaze and its limitations, and also on the limitations of bilingualism, of, sorry, of monolingualism. Why do you look at me? You don't know where I'm from. I'm a country girl, my yayaikuna at heart. Um, when I sing to you, look at me, Look at yourself, see how we are lost, how you are lost in the horizon, lost in your own stare. Lost in your own stare. Uh, please tell me why you look at me like that. With this song, I will steal your heart away. And this last line is in Quechua. The thread, I will steal your heart away, um, is the place also where the agency stands out. And it comes in Quechua. And for those who see the movie in Spanish, they don't have the subtitles, so they are as lost as uh, Salvador is. Um, the song clearly contains a warning sign. Salvador will be victimized in the movie by his own ideology. Madinusa has sex with him to thwart incest with her father, and after poisoning her father, she blames the crime on the foreigner. Salvador is indeed a savior in the native village, not as he or as a national modernizing project would expect, but as a criminal's alibi. The film ends with Madeinusa on the same track that, that took Salvador to Maya Yaikuna, this time going into Lima. Madeinusa's road to the coast, far from collective, as Arguedas' road, is built with a stratagem and murder, murder. A murder that is also an individual's rejection of a patriarchal and oppressive tradition. And I will stop here, and uh, I look forward to your questions. Yes. The quality of uh, Vargas Llosa's fiction mm -hmm. is perhaps best captured by a comment of a Brazilian historian concerning the book, La Guerra del Fim del Mundo, mm -hmm. namely, a falsificação maior, a maior falsificação de todos os tempos. Yeah. Well, um, it's interesting that you mentioned that book because um, one of uh, Vargas Llosa's point in the Informe of Uchucaray is the misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. And in that novel, he fashions the or, conflict as a misunderstanding, or, the, the impossibility to communicate, right? Which we see in his, in his other work. I, that's my claim. So yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, it's surprising that they gave him a Nobel Prize. For that. Well, yeah, that's an, <laughs> that's another discussion. Yeah, definitely. But well, it's Scandinavia, you know. <laughs> yeah. I followed your point very well about the anonymity of what is said, but I'm wondering if in a novel like Rios Profundos we have that same collectivity because there everything is seen through the lens of one yeah. adolescent. Yes. Um, yes, uh, Ernesto. Um, although, well, in that case, I think the form of the novel as a Bildungsroman, it's Ernesto growing into being someone who, who somehow manages to handle modernity and, and tradition. Um, it's not, uh, it's not in dialogue with indigenism. I wanted to, to stress how, how Arguedas works with indigenism and, and changes um, 
the role of a hero um, to represent uh, the, the native uh, communal culture. So yes, this applies to, um, to, doesn't apply to Rios Profundo in part because uh, Ernesto is, is not a native, he's a mestizo. So, um, but yes. Yeah. In, uh, well, in, in fact, this, this whole talk would have been about roads because you see um, the typical road going from the metropolis into the, the, the outside, into you know, like uh, the colonizing project of entering into the unknown or the under-civilized. Um, but what's interesting, I mean, this is Vargas Llosa, and this is the usual uh, understanding of roads. But um, what um, Arguedas, and Arguedas writes a lot about this, uh, this road that was built by, by, the, by the Indians themselves into the coast. So as to say, um, roads have a direction. Okay, roads are two-way roads, but uh, their motivation is, uh, doesn't necessarily come from the the center to the outside, so that that's what I would say about road. But definitely, road, the road is everywhere in all of these fictions. Definitely, yeah. Um, just a question about the movie. Uh, are you sure Salvador was monolingual? Because I I, I I wasn't sure if I understood in the movie. Mm -hmm. I thought he spoke some Quechua, or he, he maybe I misunderstood. Uh, he doesn't. Big Quechua, uh, he is uh, he's a, a very uh, bland character. We don't really know much about him, but he's definitely not mysterious. He's more bland than mysterious. And I would also say that they cast the, the character very well because he's not a very good actor, in my <laughs> estimation. <laughs> but um, so he, um, he doesn't. He doesn't, he doesn't speak Quechua, I mean, uh, to, to answer your question. Uh, uh, but um, but even, even if he did, he didn't listen to her. Because she, I mean, this song is, is a, sort of a warning sign of what is to come. Yes. Um, yes. This is. Uh, I mean, in Made Inusa, I'm saying. Uh, I don't know if you noticed that I say, Made Inusa is anonymous to him. So the name doesn't necessarily carry. Uh, the lack of name doesn't carry anonymity, or the name doesn't mean that the person is not anonymous. I'm understanding anonymity, in a, in a different in a different way. So, um, as to the, um, the distance between or the different articulations of anonymity in the textual and the visual, yes, I think the, the, the film allows for this uh, division between plot and, and camera gaze, which you wouldn't be able to have uh, in a fiction, I think. Um, and, and that may be one of the tools that allow Claudia Llosa to 
operate the machinery of anonymization of the other two authors uh, and question it. Um, so, so that would be my, uh, like my, how I navigate what you said, the tension between the, the textual and the, and the visual. This is uh, how I say it. Mm -hmm. so. Yes. Yes, it does. <laughs> and uh, and I think anonymity anonymity is what uh, is contested. That's what's what's to be determined. And the fact that we get the the effect of the montage, we are shown this eye, and uh, and and that cast, poses a question to the to the to the viewer. Uh, which you wouldn't have in a in a fiction. I don't I don't see how it would happen in a fiction, in in literature. Yeah. When I first saw the movie, and you now made me remember it, um, my first impression was to connect it with Rigoberta Mitchell's case, mm -hmm. because uh, I, the, what the movie reveals at the end is that the Indian is a manipulator. She manipulated Salvador to trap. And in a way, that's what the cultural construction of uh, Rigoberta Menchu was uh, after the, the story was revealed about the crosses of Casa de las Americas, as well as uh, Stoll's book, what Stoll's book brought later on in terms mm -hmm. of how she constructed uh, her family and national history and tragedy. Right. Do you have anything, uh, do you see that uh, in any way? Um, yes, one of the things that in, in my uh, thinking about anonymity uh, was how there, are, there is no uh, testimonial literature in Peru to, to speak of. Whereas um, what you say um, is, uh, is I, okay. Let's put it in, in, in another way. Um, what Rigoberta Menchu uh, does in Testimonio is not necessarily to, to lie, but to create the fiction. Uh, I don't think we can, we can judge her by Stoll's standards. No, uh, it's not cultural reflection on her enterprise. Yeah, because she was present because of Stoll and because of what was known later on about the process of Casa Las Americas, mm -hmm. she was presented to the, uh, to the audience as a manipulator. Right. Well, the ends, the ends are different because um, I would say that um, the principle of testimonio is to, to denounce a particular and to to gather, and there we have another possible, possible way of understanding anonymity, which that's why I think it's a very rich term. Uh, Rigoberta Menchu is the channel for all the anonymous people who haven't spoken, and she's, she's a representative for them. But her role is to denounce uh, what happened to, to her, uh, to her uh, community. Um, and I think the role in this, uh, the role in these fictions uh, that I've been talking about is um, is different because the Western modernizer there in this um, has the good the good master complex, which you don't see in in, uh, in Rigoberta. So I think. Uh, Elizabeth Burgos as a, as a potential, uh, yeah, as a potential uh, being manipulated by, yes, yes, um, it definitely, it definitely works. But I think that in the case of Rigoberta, the the goals are are uh, are, are very different. Like it's a preservation, it's a denunciation, it's about the injustices done to the indigenous, and. Uh, and, and this movie may, may say, look, the indigenous is not the primitive naive. You may be the naive by thinking that they are primitive and naive. Uh, so in that sense, yes, it, it works with what you're saying. But only that respect the same. Thank you.
Yeah. Yeah, framing totally is, is present, and whoever frames is the is the one with the with the agency, right? So um, he thinks that he's capturing. Actually, he's not capturing anything new. Like by taking a picture at that moment, he's repeating an old image. Um, This is going to be pretty short. That's it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> In this clip, Madinusa has been chosen as the virgin for the year in preparation for the holy time. Standing next to her is her father, who has been waiting for the holy time precisely to have an incestuous relationship with her. Salvador has taken a picture of her, and presumably he has been looking at the ceremony all this time, a tourist, a foreigner observer. So in these two clips I have shown, we see what he sees. In this early part of the movie, he's shown as an observer, a sort of intradiegetic representative of the spectator, us. As modern viewers, we even may repeat what he says at some point uh, to her, Madinusa should, to put it in other words, uh, by saying that he observes her and she looks at him and she sees him. Uh, so there is a subjective shot, him looking at her, then her looking back from her position above the rock then again the same. Yet she's the one on a pedestal of sorts, the native to be looked at in her shockingly white virgin dress. The camera choreographs to, in the end, uh, the position of Salvador. It leaves us on Salvador's place, looking at Marinusa running up the alley, flying away as a ghost, force behind the action. The protagonist is Marinusa. She is the focal point of a narrative, and we learn about her motivations, her desires, and fears, the traumatic absence of her mother, who has migrated to Lima, the envy of her sister, and the ominous presence of her father. I am suggesting with all of this that there is a tension between the gaze and the plot. Let's go now to a scene where this tension between plot and gaze explodes into a question mark. be your name, you should be Rosa or Maria. Even when he's not, sh he's not shown observing, the camera takes on his role. It examines the town's preparations for the festivity and looks at the procession from afar as if it were uh, a postcard. The camera operates that way, but the plot 
which is my, my point about the tension, the plot goes in a different direction. Because the film is not about Salvador in the way that Vargas Llosa's novel was about Lituma, or about the town, this communal festivity is the setting that enables the action and not, as in Yawar Fiesta, the driving 